later on the an, in the afternoon, and I was thinking to myself, here I sit in my study on such a beautiful day, preparing for tonight's presentation. But we're glad you're here. I'm glad to be here too. And we are going to be blessed by God again. I have just one piece of business that I need to take care of. Remember that when we had our first night, we said, if you bring two people, you can get a book. And then last night, we said, discount. If you bring one person, you can get a book. And I have a book to give away. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for bringing oh. a guest. <laughs> uh, we really appreciate that. And you will enjoy the book. Uh, it is uh, on the life of Christ and one of the very best that I have ever read. So tonight, uh, once again, we are going to few sing a few songs. And we have someone new to lead our song service for tonight. I would like to introduce you to Matthew Parker. Matthew, if you would like to come and lead us in our songs. Thank you, sir. How about we start with Fill My Cup, Lord. Like the woman at the well I was seeking For things that cannot satisfy Our next song will be, Shall We Gather at the River? Mm -hmm. 
Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God? Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. On the margin of the river, washing up its silver spray, we will walk and worship ever all the happy saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Ere we reach the shining river, lay we every burden down. Grace our spirits will deliver and provide a robe and crown. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Soon we'll reach the shining river. Soon our pilgrimage will see. Soon our happy hearts will quiver with the melody of peace. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of Now, if you would please stand and join us in our theme song, we're going to sing Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. seated. Once again tonight, uh, Ella will bring us a special piece of music. Thank you, ma'am. <coughs>
very much. I don't hear this every night that I go to sleep. Uh, I wish I could. <laughs> hey, welcome tonight. We would love to uh, do a few things before we get into our topic for tonight. And the first thing is looking at our quiz. So did you do the quiz? Did you bring it along? And let's uh, review the quiz. We were talking about Israel in prophecy last night. And here, hmm? Oh, I took the wrong quiz. <laughs> A thief in the night, there we go. <laughs> yes. Yes, I almost gave you all the answers. <laughs> ah, thank you, Jeff, a thief in the night. So, first of all, question was, what promise does Jesus make in the last chapter of Revelation that is repeated three times in that chapter? I'm coming quickly. Yes, yes. Name at least three things that makes it clear that Jesus won't come quietly and secretly. Did you get those? Say again. With a loud shout. That's right. Every eye will see him. One more. What did you say? The trumpet of God will sound. That's making that, that loud noise. Okay. One more. There will be a resurrection. The dead will come out of the graves by that loud trumpet, yeah. which is going to call them up. Okay. Everybody got three? Mmm. You didn't study well. Uh, 
Will the tribulation be before or after the return of Jesus? And why do you say so? The tribulation will be before and not after. Why do we say that? Because if we believe that there will be a tribulation after everything is over and done with, people will hope on a second chance that they're not going to get because this life is the life in which we should make our decision to be with Jesus. When Jesus says some will be taken and some will be left, who is taken and who is left? Who gets taken? The, the, the wicked. Yes. And who is left? The righteous. Where will the wicked be taken to? To their destruction. Yes. Uh, some good students here. Or maybe it's a good lecturer. Uh, I can't say that every night, eh? Okay. Do we find the word millennium in the Bible and what does it refer to? The word millennium, not in the Bible. What does it refer to, though, when we talk about the millennium? A thousand-year reign in which Jesus will uh, take his people to be with him in heaven. Okay, that was tonight's quiz, uh, last night's quiz. I hope you fared okay. Uh, make sure that our uh, couple at the table uh, see your quiz and mark you as doing the quiz so that at the end of our quizzes we will be able to give you a special gift for completing the quizzes. Tonight there's another quiz and of course there is another lecture printed material that you can get and eventually if you have come nine nights you can get a copy of our binder in which you can put your lectures the printed material and you can also get a Bible with special helps at the back uh, for Bible study if you come for three nights. Now, we've already given one of these to someone. Uh, that was you uh, already being here for three nights. So, do you need to come tomorrow night to fill your three nights? No. no. No, because we won't be here tomorrow night. Tomorrow night is off. But we will be here on Tuesday and Wednesday night. So soon enough, most of you will be able to get your free Bible and be well on your way to the uh, ring binder. Oh, there is something more that I would like to introduce you to, and that is we have a few copies of every night's presentation, and we'll have them in the future. And we're going to sell them. Mm. If you don't come, you can buy this at the stellar price of $2. So if you need a copy of any of our presentations in the past, you can get them uh, night after at two dollars a, a, a pop and uh, you can go listen to them or share them with somebody else. I think that takes care of our uh, announcements that I would like to make. So it's time for us to get into the word. But before we do that, 
Let's have prayer. Heavenly Father, it's good to know that you care about us and that you have sent your son Jesus to this world to buy our redemption through his blood that he shed on Calvary. As we think about our special place in your economy tonight, I pray that you will bless us and help us to understand your word just a little bit more clearer. And Lord, we want to pray for the nation of Israel and ask that you will be with them as they seek a Messiah that has already come, but that they are not necessarily uh, admonishing. So Lord, help us to see your word more clearer as we open it tonight. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So welcome. We're glad you're here. The tax on Israel in 2023 on October 7, executed by Hamas and several other Palestinian militant groups, calling it Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, have placed the country and its people on the foreground all over again. And many are concerned and intrigued by its possible biblical impetus. In 1948, <coughs> that might be a quiz question, in 1948, against all odds, Israel once again became a nation. At least twice before, they were totally destroyed. Almost totally destroyed. But now, again, they are a nation. And nearly all Christians are looking at Israel and the Middle East as a sign of the end of the world's history. One of the most popular signs would be the restoration of Israel as a nation and preparation for the rebuilding of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. It was the great general, Roman general Titus, that destroyed the Jewish temple among with the sacrifices that were offered there in the year 70 AD. The Old Testament prophet Amos predicted that the temple would be rebuilt in the last days. On that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, says Amos in chapter 9, verse 11, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. But today, though, a Muslim mosque stands on the very spot where the temple once stood. And this leads so much to so much speculation concerning the political and the military milieu in Israel. Many are searching for clues that point to the time when the temple will be rebuilt. But I want to show you in this lesson today that God is going to do something special for Israel right now and the building of the temple is already actually on its way. I want to show you from God's word the best kept 
secret about Israel in prophecy. A secret about Israel that scholars from many different churches are slowly beginning to discover themselves. A secret you will doubtfully, though, hear on the radio or see on TV, nor read it or read it in the newspapers or the popular novel series that we have referred to before, Left Behind. When I began to study the topic of Israel in prophecy, I noticed some curious texts. Here are two of them. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. Hmm. Have you considered this verse? That was Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. The apostle Paul wrote another intriguing similar note in Romans chapter 2, 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew he is, who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Interesting, don't you think? So, who is a Jew and really not a Jew? Could it be that these curious texts are trying to tell us that perhaps we have overlooked the real significance of Israel in prophecy? In order for us to understand who Israel is, we will have to go back to their beginning. In the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, and chapter 3, and the setting of all of this is the fall of man. God had treated or created, sorry, the world, perfect and good. Genesis chapter 1 Verse 31 says, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God made everything perfect, real good, very good, the Bible says. But unfortunately, Man disobeyed God, oh, that's going too fast, and in doing so, they plunged the whole world into a darkness of sin and destruction. God, with His infinite grace and mercy, though seeing man's plight, made a promise of deliverance found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, which contains the first and oldest prophecy of the Bible. I should not tell you that this is a quiz question too. It's just making it so easy. But here is what that verse says. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God told the serpent, Satan in the Garden of Eden, that there would be enmity, conflict, war, strife between him and 
the woman. And between his seed and her seed, the serpent would bruise the heel of the woman's seed and he would ga gain what seemed to be a victory over the woman. But the seed of the woman would gain the ultimate victory over the serpent. And therefore we can sing victory in Jesus. Yes, he would crush the head of the serpent. Now, if the seed of the serpent is those who follow Satan, then the seed of the woman must be those who gain the ultimate victory over Satan. And they will be called God's two people. Adam and Eve had made a mistake in, uh, in interpreting this first prophecy. They assumed they should interpret it literally. They thought that they would literally have a son who would literally crush the serpent's head. Eve began looking for that promised seed. And when they had a son, their firstborn, they called him Cain, which means acquired. They thought that they had acquired the son who would crush the serpent's head. But Cain failed. And the only head he crushed was the head of his brother when he killed him, committing the first murder in a beautiful created world that God put to our disposal. God had something far greater in mind than a literal interpretation of this prophecy. This is the first promise in the Bible of a coming Messiah, a Savior that would change the destiny of the world. The seed of the woman who received a bruised heel, apparent defeat, when he died on the cross, was Jesus and really gave a blow to the old serpent. And soon enough, when he comes again, he will totally destroy him. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Afterwards, he ascended into heaven. And one day soon, he is coming back. And he will crush the head of the serpent forever and ever. And all of this is found in this first book of the Bible. This is the first prophecy of the Bible telling us that there is, even though we have been dumped in sin, something that will change our destiny in the future. And all of the rest of Scripture really unpacks and expands this prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. We will see the final climax of this prophecy in the last book of the Bible as it unfolds there too. The book of Revelation. We find the prophecy of the seed mentioned again in Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, 
and will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I want you to notice that God made a promise to Abram that through him and his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And there is also a promised land which would be given to his seed. Genesis 12 verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. But Abram had no seed yet. And since he and his wife were almost a hundred years old, they left and didn't believe that it was possible. So turning away from their trust in God and resorting to their own human efforts to gain God's promise in their lives, Abram took Sarah's maid, Hagar, for his wife, and she conceived and bore a son, Ishmael. Genesis chapter 16 verses 1 through 11 tells that story. Now Abram had a son. He had a seed. But God said, no, this is not what I had in mind for you. Sarah, your wife, will be the one to bear the son. And he, when he came, was named Isaac. And he would be the one through which the world would be blessed. Genesis 17 verse 19. The promise was to be fulfilled through Isaac, while Ishmael, who was also Abram's son, was not included in what was going to happen. So the question that we need to ask at this point is, why was Ishmael excluded from the promise of the blessings and the land that God made to Abram and his seed? Maybe Galatians chapter 4 verse 30 will help us with the answer. Here Paul quotes Genesis chapter 21 verse 10 and says, Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Do you kind of get the idea that something exclusive is going on here? Why the one and not the other? If the only requirement for inheriting the land is to be a descendant of Abram, Ishmael qualified. But he didn't. So there's something that we need to discover as we look through the scriptures and allow, what is our principle here? Scripture to interpret scripture itself. Ishmael and uh, Abram were, uh, Isaac, sorry, were not treated the same. And we find the same thought when Jacob was included in the promise. While Esau, and what was their relationship? They were twins. Jacob is included, but Esau 
Now, could it be that there is more to being just a descendant of Abraham than merely being born into his family that makes one special? The promise of the seed continues with Jacob, who wrestled with an angel at the river Jabbok. Genesis chapter 28 verse 15 relates this detail. Behold, I am with you and will keep you whatever, wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. There at the river that night, Jacob was converted and he received a new spiritual experience and also a new name. What was he going to be called after this? Israel, yes. And Genesis 32, 24 through 28 relates the whole incident. You can read it later. The new nation of Israel was then taken into Egyptian captivity. And there the people worked as slaves to Pharaoh for 400 years. That's not a question, okay? They were, they were unable to worship the true God in the proper way. So eventually God raised up a leader, Moses, to deliver Israel through the Red Sea onto the freedom of the promised land, where they would be free to worship their God, their Creator. Next we find the nation of Israel. God's people, with God's people on the banks of the, the Jordan River, waiting for the command to cross the water and enter into the promised land. What a day that must have been. I can only the imagine the excitement. It was most probably like electricity in the air. Fortunately, eventually, at least, at last, we are going to enter the promised land where we can be free. And then Moses gets up and he preaches a final sermon. It's recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Let's read some of it. Now it shall come to pass, Moses says, if you diligently obey the voice of your, the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. What's he saying? There are bunches of blessings awaiting you if you do what I want you to do. If you obey all of the blessings that was listed in the rest of this chapter will come upon you, and I like it when it says, and it will even overtake you. That's nice, isn't it? They would be established in the promised land. They would have great wealth, and in agriculture, their crop would grow taller. Their cattle would be fatter than any of the others around. There would be no sickness. Their enemy would be destroyed. 
they would be a great nation, an example to the world. And in there, it even says that their babies would be bigger and better born and grow than any of the uh, neighboring nations. When the representatives of other nations would come to Israel to discover the secrets of their greatness, they would learn from Israel about God, who gave them everything that they would get. This was God's ultimate purpose for Israel, to be a light to the nations, to be God's witness in the world. Isaiah 43 verse 10 declares, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understood that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. This was what Israel was supposed to do. Tell the nations of the world about the Creator and the redeeming God that they served and through whom they were blessed. Through Israel, salvation then would come to the world as they know or knew about God. Indeed, he says, Isaiah 49, verse 6, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the end of the earth. That was what God had in mind for his people. The promise of the seed of the woman and to Abram and to Jacob was to be fulfilled through the nation of Israel so that the nations of the world would be blessed and also receive salvation. And then Jesus, the Messiah, would come. And if they would remain obedient to God, they would be prepared for him as Messiah and go to all the world as witnesses of what God has done through sending Jesus as the Messiah. This was God's plan and intention for his nation. And all the nations of the earth, the Bible says, would be blessed because of that. But that wasn't the only option available to Israel. Reading again in Deuteronomy chapter 28, we come to verse 15 and find these words. But. And usually when there's a but, there is some negativity or a different thought to be expressed. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all His commandments and His statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon upon you and again overtake you. Now Moses describes the curses of not being faithful to what God has called them to be. One of those are found in verse 64. Then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the other to the 
from one end of the earth to the other. And there you will serve other gods which neither you nor your fathers have known of wood and stone. The curse was a promise. Just as much as those blessings were a promise. Which promise they would receive depended upon their willingness to obey God. Now we know the sad story. Israel refused to obey. They rejected the Messiah. They crucified him. And they were truly scattered all over the entire world when the Roman general Titus captured Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. True, there is a nation in Israel today, but they do not enjoy the peace that God has promised. The peace that can only come through the Holy Spirit into our hearts that brings us to surrender to Jesus Christ. We know, we are living through it, that Israel is under constant threat of war, of constant turmoil and destruction totally dependent on aid from other nations. Even if the guns weren't there, they could have no peace because Israel is a nation that does not know God. Over 90% of the people of Israel today are atheists and they never darken a synagogue do door. They do not know Jesus Christ. And until they come to Him, they cannot receive the blessings that God has promised to those who obey, those who love Him, and those who serve Him. There is another conditional pro prophecy and unless the conditions are met and fulfilled, it won't come to pass. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 3 says, Now it shall come to pass, when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey His voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you from captivity and have compassion on, on you and gather you again from the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. What are we reading here? Only if they turn back to God can their prosperity come back to them. Have they done that? unfortunately doesn't look like it. So we have a, a, a question popping up in, 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 in my mind. Did God's word fail? Is Israel forever doomed? Paul was confronted with the same problem. And he answered, answers it to us, for us, in Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 18. Let's just look at an eye bird's view of it by reading verses 6 through 8. But it is not what the word of God has taken to effect. For they are not all Israel 
who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abram. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. Are you hearing what God is saying here? It's not because you were born with the right shaped nose. It's not because you are a circumcised Israelite that you are truly God's people. But those that are in the faith will be counted the seed of Abraham, of Israel. Here we begin to see the value of studying the Bible in its entirety. The New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old. And if we allow the Bible to explain itself, we get a better glimpse of what we really need to know to please God. Paul is telling us that the promise is not made to the literal flesh and blood descendants of Abraham, but only the children of the promise are Abraham's seed. In other words, the promise does not apply to one just because he's a born Jew or he lives in Israel. Who then are the children of the promise? Galatians chapter 3, with Paul at it again, answers the question for us. Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Doesn't matter where you were born, in what family you were born, but if you have faith, you are the sons, and may I call you also daughters of Abraham. Well, what about those who do not believe? Even if they are Abram's children by birth descent, the Bible really says they are not regarded as true Israelites. Now notice in the next verse the reason why this is so. Galatians chapter 3 verses 8 and 9. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Oh, the Gentiles, if they believe, can also be children of the promise. And the, the scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by, by faith, preached the gospel to Abram beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So they rose, uh, <laughs> so then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. In other words, when God told Abram, that in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. He was already preaching the gospel of salvation that would come through Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. That's a reason that only people of faith, people who are believers, can be the children of Abraham or children of of the promise. The promise was to be fulfilled finally in Jesus when he came to this world. So who's the seed of, of the woman? Who is the one who will crush the head of the serpent? 
Who is this special seed of Abram? Paul makes it stunningly clear in Galatians chapter 3.16. Now to Abram and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Paul emphatically insists that the promise were not made to many people, but only about Christ. So, does that leave us out of the picture then? No. Oh, no. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, 26 through 29, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. I'm getting excited when I read something like that. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abram's seed and heirs according to to the promise. Isn't that exhilarating? If I believe in Jesus Christ and what He has done on Calvary on my behalf, I become a child of the promise. I become seed of Abram. And I will inherit what was made available to Abram and God's people. It's a mind-boggling statement. If you are in Christ, then you are Abram's seed. Then you are truly Israel. It means that when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we become children of Abraham. Abraham's children are therefore not merely those who are born into his family, but everyone that believes in Jesus Christ. We have the witness of both the Old and the New Testament that the true Israel of God today is not Israel of old, but the church. The only way to be a part of Israel, the Israel of God, is to be baptized in Him and therefore become heirs to the promise or promises that God has made. It's clear that there are two Israels in the Bible. There is the true Israel of God, the church, and then there is the Israel that rejects God, those who say that they are Jews because they were born Jews, but are really not truly Jews. Revelation 2, 9 says, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews and not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Does the Bible really say that the true Israel of God is the church? Or did you just make that up, Pastor Peter? So let's ask the best interpreter of the Bible that we can get. Who would that be? 
Jesus himself, the inspiration for the Bible. Jesus, what do you think about this whole question? Now, can we believe Jesus when he interprets the Bible? Of course we can. So here we find him in Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 43, making some observations about Israel. We find him telling a parable to the rulers of Israel about a man who planted a vineyard and rented it out to be cared for. And when harvest time came, he sent his servants to get the fruit, but the keepers of the vineyard beat them and killed them. Finally, the owner set his son, uh, sent his son and the hirelings killed him too, so they could have the vineyard all for themselves. Actually, Jesus is, uh, is, is explaining an Old Testament song that we find in Isaiah 5. It's to a song of a vineyard that keeps yielding wild fruit. And after God has done all he could for that vineyard, Isaiah 5 verse 4, he finally comes to the place where he says, And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burnt and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. It will lay to waste. It shall not be pruned or dug. But there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. Quite a terrible ending to the vineyard that was supposed to be God's vineyard. And then verse 7 says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Now, what have we just seen here? The Bible is explaining itself. We read about this vineyard that didn't do so well. Even though God, the, the owner, did everything that he could to save this vineyard. And now Isaiah comes and he says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression, for righteousness will behold a cry for help. So in Matthew chapter 21, the vineyard that Jesus is talking about is also the nation of Israel. And Jesus discusses their situation. He says the owner of the vineyard sent his servants, but they were stoned, beaten, and killed. This represents God's sending of his prophets who were constantly rejected by God's people, the Israelites. Here, the heart-rending thoughts about that when Jesus shares with his listeners, saying, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. God so desperately wanted to do something for Israel, but they refused. And then, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This symbol 
of Jesus as the cornerstone is extremely significant. Remember it, we will come back to it. Of what is Jesus the cornerstone? Let's first look at the consequences the nation must suffer because they rejected the Son of God. Since Israel rejected the cornerstone, Jesus, <coughs> because they killed the Son, notice carefully what Jesus says will happen. Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. What an incredible statement. We have the words of Jesus himself saying that the kingdom of God is taken away from the nation of Israel and given to a new nation. taken away. This, belong, th th this means that they no longer possess it because you cannot have something if it was taken away from you. God patiently strove with them for thousands of years sending them his prophets and finally his own son whom they rejected and crucified. What more could he do? So the nation of Israel is no longer God's chosen people. But there is a new nation who receives the kingdom of God. Who are they? We've alluded to that yet already, but I would love for you to turn with me to Second uh, Peter chapter nine. Second uh, uh, Peter chapter two, verse nine. First of all, let's just say Peter writes his book to the church, consisting of both Jewish and Gentile Christians. And this is what he says, but you are a chosen people. Did I pass that one? Yes, ah, there we go. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. It's almost too hard to believe, but do you get it? Once you were no people, once you have not received mercy, you were me merely Gentiles, pagans, but now you are a holy nation because you have stepped into a faith relationship with God. Friends, Every one of us here tonight, if we believe in Jesus Christ, have come to the living stone that was rejected by the builders. If you have accepted him, if he is the master of your life, then you are part of a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, God's own people. That's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, you are God's Israel. I know that might be 
not really, f uh, I know that we might not really fully begin right now to comprehend all that we have shared. And we will be unfolding more of its meaning night after night. But for now, I want to tell you that even just a glimpse will help us see the importance of who we are if we are in a faith relationship with Jesus. We become God's to Israel. And he will fulfill all his promises that he made to Israel of old in our own lives. His promises will be fulfilled in the new Israel of God. In this new nation, his church, spiritual Israel. Because, and I love this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 20, it, where it says, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Does that mean that Jews are to be left out of the kingdom of God? No. Paul devotes an entire chapter, Romans 11, and the, 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 the story of that uh, chapter is the parable of an olive tree that shows that Jesus can still save individual Jews when they come to be a part of his faith-based people. Even though the nation rejected God, the Jews as individuals can still be saved in the same way all of us are saved, by accepting Jesus Christ. Christians do not replace Jews in God's kingdom. Indeed, there is, remember what Paul said, no Jew, no Gentile, but in Christ Jesus, we are his kingdom. The Bible message is not an anti-Semitic message. It simply means that Jews, like Gentiles, find their complete fulfillment in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. Just as the nation of Israel was to be a light to the nations, now Jesus comes and says to the church, His true Israel, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. That is what God wants us to be, a light to the nations, to tell everyone that we come into contact with that there is life, there is uh, light in Jesus Christ. Yes, he says, and go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The church is to carry out the mission which the nation fulfilled to do. And all of the blessings which God promised to the nation will also be fulfilled to the church, God's to Israel. Hey, one more thing. Didn't you forget about the, the promised land? Are we all going to live in that little piece of land where Israel lives today? Where Abram got the promise that there is a promised land. I've got some good news from the Bible for you too. 
In Romans chapter 4, 13, Paul says, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abram or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. How big is the promise? How big is the promised land? It's not just a tiny bit of real estate somewhere in the Middle East. But the promise to Abram was actually that he would inherit the world. And John adds to this. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Who lives in this city? Who lives in this real estate? Jesus makes a promise in his letter to the church of Philadelphia. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a promise from God. There is a new place coming. We, we saw the other night that he said, I am preparing you a place and when I'm done, I will come and get you. And in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners. We, we, we're part of the family. But fellow citizens, citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone. Ah, we're back at the cornerstone. Christ, the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Jesus is the cornerstone of God's household. But what is the household of God that Paul is referring to here? But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. The New Testament uses the Old Testament ma metaphor of Mount Zion, which was the Temple Mount, and Jerusalem as a symbol of God's church for those who have come.
to Jesus. Don't miss it. It's crucial. In the New Testament, Jerusalem, the capital city of ancient Israel, now is the church. And John goes just a little further while describing this city in Revelation chapter 21. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And the, la uh, the lamb, uh, okay, I'll just read it to you. Uh, apparently, our computer uh, decided to, to quit. And he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Yes, the city is a symbol of the church, built on the foundation of the apostles and the, oh, there we go, uh, the apostles and the uh, stuck for the word, uh, the ark, uh, the fathers, let's call them the fathers of the old Israel uh, company or nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God has a place for each one of us. He has a plan for each one of us. He has a place reserved for each one of us. He is the King of Kings. And according to what I think we have seen tonight, and I hope you have seen it too, we are His sons and daughters. You are important to God and important to his plan. Just as he intended to use Israel of old to reach the nations of the world, God will use you and me to let his light shine forth in the world. You can stand tall with your head high because, my friends, you are child of the king to Israel if you have opened your heart and allowed him to live in it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that each one of us will open our hearts to you so that you can come and live within us and we will be a part of the true Israel and when we see you come upon the clouds of heaven, may we go live in that land that you have prepared for us, not only a small little real estate somewhere in the east, but the world that you have prepared for your children. I pray it in Jesus' name. I hope that you have filled out your little white cards already 